thank you everybody for uh, coming today. and Thank you for the invitation to be here and to discuss about this topic. The title that was given to me is Formality versus Informality in Job Creation. And I'm going to say something specifically about formality and informality. I'm going to spend uh, more time talking about job creation and uh, uh, raising people's earnings and standards of living. So before I proceed, uh, I just want to put uh, two uh, uh, pieces of terminology on the table. The first is that, at least in my 20 minutes, I'm not going to distinguish at all between a job and employment. And that is to say that we have the standard ILO definitions. You are employed if you worked one hour or more for pay last week. You are employed if you worked 15 hours or more not for pay last week. You are unemployed if you were not employed but you actively looked for work and you're out of the labor force if you did not actively look for work and you were not working either. So those are the standard definitions. We'll use those. Now, one place where the labor economist in me uh, uses different terminology from what we just heard from Martin is what is a labor market? I define a labor market and labor, as labor economists do, which is the place where labor services are bought and sold. And uh, the richer the country, the more likely it is that the labor services of a worker are sold to an employer in, through an employer-employee relationship. But uh, the poorer the country, as Martin showed us, self-employment is particularly important. And in those cases, the labor market, as, as labor economists think about it, is that people are selling their labor services to themselves precisely because no employer is uh, buying their labor services. So I just want to say that uh, when uh, I talk about labor markets, I'm not going to exclude in any way self-employed. Quite to the contrary, it's important to include the self-employed. Um, okay, so growth and development. The, uh, it's important to start with definitions, I think. Uh, and that is that for me, economic development is about improvements in people's material standards of living. There are other aspects of social development that get into other aspects of people's standards of living, but the material part is what I think defines economic development. I like to think in terms of ultimate development objectives and to ask what is the ultimate development objective. A bit of jargon, I sometimes call it bottom line management. I wrote a book on that. It was a, uh, one of the world's great non-sellers. Uh, and um, uh, in technical language, uh, what people might call the bottom line is what we economists call maximans. Uh, what is it you're trying to maximize or what is it that you are trying to minimize? When uh, I say that the, t the teams remaining in uh, the Soccer World Cup are all trying to win the Soccer World Cup. I think that goes without saying uh, that th that's what their maximand is. So we, when we're talking about economic development, what is our maximand? What are we trying to achieve? And I think we're trying to achieve uh, improvements in people's material standards of living. Economic growth, productivity growth, lots of other things then uh, I would regard as intermediate objectives, but they are not the ultimate objectives. They're not the bottom line objective. They're ways of getting there. Just like scoring goals and preventing the other team from scoring goals are approaches to winning the game in order to win the, uh, the Soccer World Cup. And so in seeking higher household incomes, um, the, uh, the, the data show, and Martin talked about this, that the, um, that most people get most of their income from, from the work they do, that therefore jobs, employment, are important for people to attain higher material standards of living. And um, it's said that uh, there are people, uh, two kinds of people in the world, those that put things into two categories and those that don't. Uh, I'm one of those people that puts things into categories. And so the two categories I have here are two means for improving uh, uh, household incomes and uh, uh, achieving better work opportunities. One is through more and better wage employment uh, or salaried employment, wage and salary together. Uh, there's, a, there's an issue in translating from the Spanish, but let me not get into that. Um, and uh, the other is through higher self-employment earnings. And those two, that is more and better wage employment and higher self-employment earnings are precisely 
what I understand two of the three themes of this conference to be, that is, structural transformation and inclusion. So uh, this uh, uh, talk is very much about those issues. Countries face conflicting jobs goals. On the one hand, they want more jobs. On the other, and they want jobs with higher earnings. Anybody who has taken basic labor economics knows that uh, an ordinary downward sloping labor demand curve mean, uh, has uh, embodied in it the idea that higher wages paid will cause employers to hire fewer workers. And so there's a trade-off right there. In addition, the jobs offer, um, some jobs offer social protections and some do not. So I'll talk here uh, a little bit about labor market protections, such things as health and safety legislation, hours legislation, other sorts of things. And then um, what is in British English called social security, that is pensions, health insurance, and other social programs. Um, and uh, they, there may be conflicts between wages and these protections on the one hand, between more employment and more protected employment on the other hand. Economics is called the dismal science for a reason, and uh, these are among the reasons. Now, the title of this talk they gave me was Formality versus Informality in Job Creation. Um, I quote my friend and colleague Ravi Kanbert, who uh, said, informality is a term that has the dubious distinction of combining maximum policy importance and political salience with minimal conceptual clarity and coherence in the analytical literature. Uh, I think the very best thing to do with the term informality is not use it. Um, and to instead, to talk about self-employment or wage employment, to talk about registered employment or non-registered employment, to talk about uh, workers who are covered by social protections and workers who are not. And, uh, so, but I understand what the point is. The point of this title is to say that uh, in addressing the issue of job creation, there may be these kinds of trade-offs, and uh, policymakers are going to find those trade-offs difficult to, uh, to achieve. It's no answer, by the way, to say, well, there are three good things, and so I want all three, if we know that uh, they conflict in, in, in a fundamental sense with each other. So uh, let me talk for a moment about informal sector and informal employment. It actually took me a number of years in conversations that uh, we had uh, Ravi and uh, Koshik Basu and Harun Borat and others uh, for me to understand the difference between informal employment and informal sector. Informal sector, by definition, is that the enterprise itself is not registered with the government. Um, informal employment would occur when those people who work in as employees in those enterprises or those people who are self-employed are not registered with the government. But that's not the end of informal employment. Informal employment also occurs when the enterprise is registered with the government, but the worker is either not registered with the government or registered with the government but not protected for a variety of reasons. For example, because that the worker is a probationary worker because the worker is hired in casual employment, um, which uh, where the employer says, we will hire you today, maybe we'll hire you tomorrow, uh, uh, or we will hire you today, and after 89 days, the employer says, we won't hire you tomorrow because legislation kicks in tomorrow. Uh, but if you'd like to come back next week, um, there's a good chance that we'll have a job for you again. And, and so uh, uh, what does that mean? In a country like India, here are the percentages. Of the people who are em employed in India, 85% of them are employed in informal employment in the informal sector, defined as uh, the employer, the, work the uh, entity, the self-employment activity is not registered with the government. Another 7% of employment is informal employment in the formal sector, people who work for, uh, where, in jobs where 
the employer is registered with the government, but the workers don't have the protections that uh, might uh, come to others. And 8% of employment in India is formal employment in the formal sector. The metaphor is often used of let's, let's uh, study the dog, let's not study the tail. Uh, it's not the uh, tail that's wagging the dog, it's the dog that's wagging the tail. And if we look just at formal employment and those enterprises that are registered with the government and those workers that are working in those enterprises, we're missing most of them in India and many other countries at similar uh, stages of development. So broadly speaking then, there are groups of jobs policies to consider. Uh, I used to use the term uh, uh, that groups of labor market policies to consider, except that people sometimes object and they say that labor market policies are those things that happen within the labor markets, labor, narrowly defined as they think about it. Uh, you just heard Martin talk about labor supply, labor demand, and wage determination. And you all, we also heard him say that uh, very important policies happen um, outside the labor market. So the terminology I like to use here to capture the ideas that you just heard him put forward are that there are policies in the labor market and policies impinging upon the labor market. Policies in the labor market are addressed to how specifically the labor market works. Policies impinging upon the labor market are policies that affect in particular where the labor demand curve is positioned. Uh, also where the labor supply curve is positioned and, uh, and so all of these are policies uh, to consider. So in order to consider policies with regard to um, wage employment, with regard to self-employment, let's first consider the broad economic policies. Um, there's lots of talk at this conference, um, and I think rightfully so, about these issues that I've put on this slide. Uh, economic growth, trade, aid, uh, investment climate, harnessing the energies of the private sector, because it's the private sector that's an important creator of, of jobs. Just say, by the way, that when people are self-employed, they certainly are not self-employed in the public sector, so they get counted as being in, uh, working in the private sector, uh, but they're not working as employees in the private sector. They're working as self-employed in the private sector. And so the statement is sometimes made that the private sector is responsible for creating most jobs, which is a really weird way of thinking that I have created my own job. Uh, by buying a pack of 20 cigarettes and then selling them to people poorer than I am one at a time at a higher unit cost. I don't think of that as the private sector has created a job for me. I think of that as I have created a job for me. But uh, uh, anyhow, uh, that's, uh, these are some of the broad economic policies and it certainly helps. It's not sufficient, but it certainly helps to get these broad economic policies right. So there are lots of things that can be done to increase the opportunities for paid employment. I know this is a cluttered slide, and I cluttered it up just so this would all fit on one page. And I could tell you that uh, uh, there's a lot to be said about this. And in my last book, which I was very surprised to find is actually on the Oxford University Press table out here, uh, it's called Working Hard, Working Poor. And there's a chapter on increasing the opportunities for paid employment that includes these points that I'm not going to read out to you. And uh, there's also a chapter on raising the returns to self-employment. And I'm also not going to read out what those issues are. Um, but these are some of the means of thinking about how to raise people's standards of living through the work they do. OK, now uh, talked about, I talked earlier about trade-offs in the labor market. One big labor market policy trade-off must be faced is resources are limited. Yes, thank you. Okay. Resources are limited. Uh, that to use money for one thing means not to use it for another. Uh, another limitation, an important one, is that policy attention may very well be limited, and so too may administrative capacity. And so we have to avoid in our policy making um, getting policymakers so distracted that they can't actually do the work of making policy and, uh, or administering 
policies that have been decided upon. So we have to make choices. This is the economist's question. How do we allocate scarce resources among alternative uses? And we have to ask the question then, how much effort should be devoted to creating more jobs with social protections versus using some of the resources or all of the resources to help formalize the informal versus or and or helping those who remain unprotected to be protected, perhaps by getting out of where they are and moving into uh, those sectors of, of the labor market uh, where job protections are more plentiful. These are some of the challenges to be faced. What I want to conclude with is a policy case study. Uh, I thank Ravi for organizing an opportunity for a number of us to have had homestays with working women and their families in India, South Africa, and Mexico, and then repeat visits to India and South Africa. Uh, we were divided into groups of two. We lived with working women and their families. And um, when, uh, when we went to South Africa, I lived with a woman named Masibisi, who had earned her livelihood by selling handicrafts. Uh, the way that she had sold her handicrafts before I met her for the first time was that she had uh, obtained a license from a friend in order to rent a stall along the oceanfront in Durban. And this was a government regulated place uh, with a limited number of spaces. And for several years, she sold her handicrafts in that particular place. And one day, a police inspector came by, and he said, show me your identity card. And she showed her card. And then the police inspector said, show me your, your license for this stall. And she showed the license for the stall. But the license for the stall was not in her name. The license for the stall was in the name of a friend from whom she had rented the license. And the policeman said, this is not legal. Uh, you have to get out of here. Uh, I will give you 24 hours. If you are here 24 hours from now, I am going to confiscate whatever I find in this stall. So she left. And she had difficulty finding a new livelihood. But then she and her husband found a new way to make an even better living, which was that they, so, uh, they made and sold Zulu shields, uh, which Zulu people bought for ceremonial purposes and which tourists like me bought uh, to decorate, in my case, the office uh, uh, I have at Cornell. And if you come visit me at Cornell, you can see my Zulu shield I bought from her. That's how they made their livelihood. Uh, but what happened is that the, uh, the government had been hassling them. Uh, and making it impossible for them to uh, earn a livelihood the way that they had been trying to. Yes. Um, another thing that was striking about the oceanfront in Durban was the absence of something that one sees every place else in the developing world, which is people who are selling fruit juices and ice creams and slices of pineapple and all sorts of other things walking along the beach and trying to sell it to people on the beach. There were no such people there. And the reason there were no such people, as people there is because the local authorities had decided that these people uh, were threats to the people who were enjoying themselves on the beach. And so to conclude the story then, we in our group, um, uh, Ravi and Koshik and Harun and the others of us, Francie, uh, w uh, met with the government. And the, the government official who was responsible for this said to us, um, I, uh, we are doing this. My job is to protect you, he said, pointing to us, the foreign visitors, against them. Okay? And normally, I keep my mouth shut with, in such things when I'm in other people's countries, but I couldn't that time. So I just said, sir, excuse me, please. I do not want to be protected against them. I would like uh, them to be able to learn, earn their livelihoods. So to just finish the, 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 the thought in 30 seconds. Um, the point is, I said at the beginning, remember that there are ultimate development objectives. 
The ultimate de development objective, as I said, is to try to enable people to earn higher material standards of living. That's the, that's the essence of economic development. Uh, if we lose sight of those ultimate objectives and put into effect other uh, things that get in the way, such as these kinds of regulations, people are going to lose their livelihoods. And I think the question to ask then is, how can they earn their livelihoods? Uh, I've given some, what I think are some answers, and this last part is what not to do. Thank you very much.